Good morning. You are on stage two of the API Days Hong Kong 2022 conference. Uh, let's get right into it. First of all, I would like to introduce uh, Steve. He is a developer relations lead APJ at New Relic. Hey, Steve, how are you doing? He's good. All right. Steve is going to talk a little bit about the story of OpenAPI uh, and GPT-3 and how we can improve observ observability with tracing. Over to you, Steve. All right, everyone, hopefully you can hear and see me, right? So without further ado, I won't want to waste your time. Let's get straight into it. Hello, everyone. My name is Steve. I'm a developer relations lead here in New Relic Asia. I predominantly work on platform advocacy, being the bridge between our engineers, developers, but also we did our product engineering to make sure that you have a really good time. So what we're going to do here is today, we're going to talk about the story of open AI, not open API. OpenAI GPT-3. OpenAI is actually one of the earliest open source AI systems that's very available out there. They form into an entity and GPT, GPT-3 just means that third generation right there. So for me, what I do is I spend a lot of time spend, uh, experimenting, maybe working with technologies that our customers are using or but also what's new in the industry. But most importantly, I cover on the secondary part that usually engineers get really excited. Those engineers would get really excited with a new technology, but quite often after you build the technology, you need to think about uptime, reliability, and all the things that's keeping that services out right there. So this is my talk. This is what I'm going to talk about today. So without further ado, let me just move forward right there. So when I, when I always approach the topic of AI, I'm very excited, but I'm also very skeptical at the same time, because for us as engineers, we're very excited with new technology development, but sometimes we also need to understand the reality of those technology right there. So what you see right here, what you see is actually a, a Gartner hype curve that really talk about the different technology curve that's actually going on right now. AI and data was well, very exciting. There are certain use cases you need to be mindful where it's right, and where it's not right right now. So you can see most of the technology is around two to five years and what OpenAI really fits into the natural language, data labeling, but also AI cloud services right there. So this is API days and today, rest assured, everything I'm gonna to mention today is all API driven. Even the AI that I mentioned call is called OpenAI is actually API driven too. And I'll talk about some of the final details where you can access those data. Most importantly, I've been looking at AI and data for a pretty long time, and I always want to ask this question is, are we there yet? Is this a good time, especially this year moving forward, where engineers first, we can take it really serious and leverage what I call democratize of AI service. And I'm happy to say, even through my personal experience and experimentation, looks like this year could be a good one. So what you see right here is I use OpenAI using Python underneath it right there, but also here on the left-hand side, I'm using Twilio as a way of communicating the AI messages that's actually interfacing with OpenAI. But most importantly, OpenAI right now, which I also can recommend, you can actually try it out, is the AI service actually understood content and also intention. But most importantly, why I'm really impressed with OpenAI, because especially for us in Asia, we sometimes have slang, lingo or certain words that we use <clears throat> to actually explain certain things so here for me i'm based in singapore and the one that we always like to use within our slogans here is the difference between roti prata and roti chanai it's actually fluffy bread but i want to test to see if the ai is smart enough to understand the difference around it and i'm happy to say it is possible but also when you ask this ai about arguments and opinion can the ai come up with an opinion what they think it should be but for me, I like, because again, I'm based in Singapore, I always like to tease this within my friend. Is it Singapore or Malaysia? Which one is better? And I'm pretty impressed that AI right here actually has an opinion. But most importantly, I validated with real people. Yes, I validated with real people to see if AI really makes sense. And I'm happy to say the development of open AI or AI as in general is quite close to human comprehension. So what I did right here is once I built an app, as mentioned earlier, I focused a lot on observability, uptime, reliability, SRE practices or site reliability engineering, where what I want to do is, especially API, API services or cloud-based services, that's really very hard to actually know if the service is, is right or wrong, or is it you or the service is actually really slow. Here, what I have did right here is I've used tracing. So tracing is a form of telemetry that people use to actually understand the health of the system. 
So in general, you have metrics, which most people are very familiar. You have events like a ping check, up or down. Then you have tracing, which is the new kit on the block. And you have logs. Many of us engineers are very familiar with logs, but logs sometimes are very hard to get data because it contains a lot of data and it has to transfer a lot when you move through different systems. Here, what I can see is I'm using tracing as a way of pinpointing, is it done or is it me that's very slow? And what you see is a form of tracing either using New Relic platform or you want to use open source, which I'm going to cover in, in my workshop, either choose Zipkit or Jaeger. Really, doesn't matter. Tracing is very good, especially for API service uh, that you see right there. So let me talk about the story of OpenAI, why I got drawn into it. Uh, to be very frank, because uh, I'm a gamer myself and I saw open AI is being used as a way where AI bots within uh, what I call Dota, uh, Defense of the Ancient right there, which is actually a very popular uh, multiplayer game. There's actually competition around it where open AI is being used to actually simulate user actions when you play against bots. But the one that really draw my attention is 99% of the time, over AI is able to win against human. And that really caught my attention. And I've been paying attention to open AI for a long time. And the secret sauce underneath it, why they're able to do it well, is because they do large scale reinforced learning. That's the white paper if you're interested to read about it. But what they did is they took this technology and really commercialized it and make it available to democratize it for a lot of engineers like you and I. But the one that really caught my attention is this thing called GitHub Core Pilot. GitHub Core Pilot, uh, where it's your AI pair programming. When you're writing code, the AI will suggest code snippets to you on the fly. That's leveraging open AI. That's a very impressive, but at the same time, it's quite scary. Because for us as engineers, sometimes we get very scared. We get really get scared because, oh no, you know, if AI could write code, what do I need to do? Rest assured, we're still far from that. The AI only provides you suggestions, but ultimately, you as a software developer, you still need to write code. But one of the ones that's really quite interesting is uh, GitHub Copilot is quite good in creating code templates, as you can see right here. Uh, someone actually shared in Twitter where OpenAI is able to create what I call a React based template uh, based on what they saw underneath it right there. So, what is OpenAI? So, OpenAI was actually co founded by Elon Musk, which is the co founder of Tesla. And also Sam Altman, which if you're in the world of startup, you probably heard about Y Combinator. Again, those are very prominent individuals, and they pull their funds together to actually focus on AI and research. Uh, they have a very holistic goal. They want to make sure that AI is done in the right way. It's one of the very few initiatives that what I call open source AI, where a lot of people contribute, but also try to shape that AI is done correctly right there. And I got to say, they really achieved what they did. Uh, now it now OpenAI is actually pretty cool. It's a lot of good documentation, a lot of good use case. But most importantly, it's very cost efficient, uh, where you can actually pay what you use, You know, not very expensive to actually use those services right there. And probably the flagship, which, you know, leveraging what you see in the world of Web 3.0 and NFT, non-fungible token, uh, DAO E2 is actually that service that actually generate uh, what I call art based on AI services right there. So you actually can generate your art if you're not really good at drawing right there. So as mentioned earlier, GPT-3 is the third generation. It's actually predominantly based on natural processing language, where it understands what's your intent, what you're trying to do, and it made it available right here as an API service. So as mentioned earlier, GPT stands for General Purpose Transformer version 3. It was released not long ago. It was in a private beta, and they just made it into public release not long ago. But the one that really caught attention is the amount of machine learning, uh, artificial neural network. It's approximately uh, 175 billion, which is way, way above compared to most services that you have right there. But the one that, that really what I call achieve in a milestone and really generate the buzz in the industry is uh, the comprehension between AI and human is getting very blurred. And you can see some of the research. And even when I built the services myself and I was trying out with my friends, my friends couldn't either differentiate is it a real people on AI. So that's just quite impressive. And there's a lot of startups and a lot of use case that evolves around open AI. But the one thing they do very well in open AI is they're able to do what I call pre-generative pre-training, where they're able to learn based on unlabeled data. You got to understand AI in the past is so hard because you have to do a lot of labeling and you don't do a tagging to actually tag the data to actually specific data attribute. But what GPT does quite well in OpenAI is actually able to self learn uh, based on unlabeled data and actually able to tag its own self. It's actually pretty, pretty impressive. 
one thing you got to be on, be mindful of is not entirely open source. Uh, now, right now, Open AI GPT is actually owned by Microsoft, and that's why if you see GitHub again, it's owned by Microsoft. They built that open uh, GitHub Copilot based on GPT three. So just be mindful of that it's not entirely open source. It's now actually owned by Microsoft. So how do you get started? Get started is really really easy. Uh, I actually first drawn to their public website. Uh, they actually have a very easy to understand. Uh, documentation, especially for us engineers, we love good documentation, and I gotta say they did it quite well. But most importantly, they actually give you a really good use case what you can build on top of Open AI GPT. So a good example is like Duolingo. So you might not know Duolingo, that language translation app. Yes, their language translation service is actually built on top of Open AI GPT three. So for example, if you put French or maybe you put Spanish or maybe whatever language that you have, it actually translates on the fly. And it's because it's le leveraging natural language processing, it understands your intent and actually translate that quite nicely for you right there. But also GitHub Copilot, as mentioned early, there's a lot of examples that's available to you where maybe you don't want to write SQL query. Maybe you want to use AI or open AI to do the translation for you. It is possible by using open AI uh, GPT-3 right there. Without further ado, uh, you, if you ever attended my talks or this is your first time, I always like to kind of mix, uh, you know, like seeing things in action, but also kind of explain to you and where you can get additional resource. And let's just flip very quickly on the, the page that you can see with OpenAI right there. So as mentioned earlier, what you want to do is you can actually go to openai.com uh, slash API. And they do have a really, really simple, comprehensive point of view how you can build services already. As mentioned earlier, this is API days. We're probably going to focus on API. And thank God, OpenAI has very good API documentation and services available to you. So when you actually go to openai.com, it actually gives you a really good get started guide. It tells you the code, what you need to do, because especially of engineers, if you're watching this uh, uh, talk, Sometimes you need to understand how things work underneath the hood. They actually have very good, and I'll just talk a bit more later on. But most importantly, it gives you a really good uh, summary of what you can expect within the technology, like copywriting, summarization, passing up unstructured data, everything around it. And it does a really good job. And also, what I like about this particular service is you don't need to be an AI engineer to actually leverage AI service. As it actually gives you the ability as a software developer to just focus and develop, and you're actually quite good with that right there. So especially, there's actually quite a lot. Uh, and as you can see, some of the services actually built through OpenAI API, like GitHub Copilot, Go Duolingo. But I also know that many friends and family, but also other companies are actually building services on top of it right there. So as mentioned early, this is their, what I call their flagship service right now, where you can actually use AI system to actually draw a realistic image and are uh, based on the description that you provide through natural language programming right there. Right now, this service is on private invitation only. It's not available for public beta, but it's actually a good service that came in at the right time with what's going on with blockchain, crypto, NFT. Uh, you actually can use AI to actually make some drawings for you, especially if you're interested in that service right there. As mentioned earlier, if you're interested to join the wait list, which I already did, if you already have one, you actually can go into it. But the concept is very similar, where you can actually use natural language processing, but also can actually generate art. So let's talk about the final details right there. As mentioned earlier, documentation is really rock solid. There's a lot of quick tutorial guides that you can go through. And you actually can go through that quick tutorial guide. It actually explain to you the concept of intent, context, temperature, and a lot of things right there. Again, we probably won't have time to cover everything, but I want to talk about uh, some of the examples that's actually available to you either through Python or some of the programming language right there. But the one I want to draw your attention is actually what I call examples is available to you. So as mentioned earlier, usually developers, what we do is we look at a documentation, we want to figure out use case, and they do a really good job in telling you in that. So for example, if I'm looking to do SQL translation, from maybe from different queries and that, it actually tells you what you want to transfer. But most importantly, the most important part, it actually tells you the code around it. And you can see, hey, maybe I want to write in Node, maybe in Curl, in JSON. But here in this example, I'm using Python because a lot of data science people use Python to actually create the app. That's the most impressive part. It actually gives you code example, and that's the only code you need to actually do that. It's actually pretty impressive right there. So again, if you ever built AI systems before in the past, you know you need to write really large chunks of code. Good thing about being a cloud-based API-driven architecture, they already did most of the hard work for you. You just need an API token key, 
fire up the service and from there they're good to go right there so right here you actually they have a playground right here so what you actually can do is you can play around with the service so for example write me a poem about hong kong and you actually can uh, generate right there and it's actually generate on the fly what it does is actually based on natural language processing you actually identify what you try to do after it goes into the back end api and actually use ai to actually generate those text right there so you can see there's quite a lot of good things you can do here and you can tweak the sensitivity of your ai just using the ui but again what is really really interesting is you actually can go to view code right here and you can see that's what you need to do in order to achieve that that's how simple it is. That's why I'm really excited to talk about OpenAI GPT right there. Now, if you go back into the backend code, what you need to do is just something like this. So this is my example of a Python file. You usually have your what I call content, uh, what I call your code structure. But the one that really matters is this part right here. That's it. What I'm doing is when I do a post request, I fire off with the token that I have, and that's the code that I copy out what I'm showing you earlier. Once this is done correctly, uh, you actually can build simple web application like this. So again, just to save us some time, if let's say I want to run, I want to get some name for my dog, uh, I can actually go back, fire up that specific name, come back with a response. Again, maybe I want to get some name for a cat. This is done automatically for you on the fly where you don't really need to build very complex AI services on the back end. Right okay, so this is part one, but I'll talk about how you actually build open AI. There's a lot of good uh, use case and documentation, and it's actually really easy to build. Like for me, it took just a like a day or two to actually get it on the running. And I'm really happy already. I'm stop having fun with my AI service right there. So just a quick recap, as mentioned early, open AI pick playground is actually quite cool. Uh, everything is actually going through the backend API that you actually can actually leverage right there. And the secondary part is once you build services like this, how do I know, is it my app or is it your app? That's where tracing makes a lot of sense. So as you can see right there, here's an example that I did with my name, my pad, and that's actually using the code, which I've shown you earlier. That's actually just the amount of code you need to actually build some really interesting services around it. And it's actually really, really easy to get started with democratized AI service. Right so the next part is, especially in an API-driven architecture, that's where tracing could be a really good, important element for you when you start building services based on API-driven architecture. Uh, and as, as an industry, we are moving away from monolithic application and we're moving towards microservices right there. Like example that I've seen with open API, uh, sorry, uh, open AI, but also any API SaaS-based service or cloud-based service, eventually you need to figure out is it them or is it us? And tracing can be a really good way because tracing kind of pinpoints exactly which part of the whole API call is actually relatively slow. So again, just a nutshell, again, I'll cover it a lot in my workshop in my open source instrumentation where I'll go really deep into the concept of tracing, what's the good thing about it, what's the bad thing about it, but also other telemetry type like metrics, events, tracing, and logs. Tracing is very good from a high level service request where you can see, hey, is it, you know, when a service request traverse through A, B, C, D, and all the service, let's say hundreds or 50 different microservices, tracing is quite good in actually pinpointing is it you or is that that particular service? And after that, you can actually go deep right there. Again, I probably will not have time to co cover every single little thing on tracing, but in general, either proprietary software or even open source tracing that they use, the whole goal of a tracing is actually visualize the whole trace using some form of trace mapping or a dependency mapping to actually understand which part of a trace is actually not doing very well. And especially for API days, tracing can be a very valuable tool set that you want to use, especially when you build more services on APIs. So here's an example going back, where if you remember, I kind of play around with my open AI. I was using Twilio. I want to see with the message is actually going through propagation within my service, if the message is slow or is it my code that's very slow. So here's an example, again, just using New Relic or even same with open source like Zip in the Jaeger. Tracing is actually quite good in telling you the full story. Is it dumb or is it the service that I actually, you know, say, or is it my code that's having an issue right there? So remember that message that I actually mentioned um, as mentioned earlier, where a message is called Roti Prata, I can use tracing as a way of pinpointing exactly how long does it take to actually get the response, and within my whole environment, which part is actually causing a bottleneck. As you can see, with this using distributed tracing, most of the time it's even spent on the open AI layer, where it's actually sending a request, getting a response that, processing it, as you can see, most of the delay. Okay? With that, let me just start thinking, wrapping up. How do I instrument it in AI service? I'm going to tell you this. 
the likelihood that you're going to build more innovative on latest technology where you need to figure out a way to figure out the right instrumentation technique. And this is what I did, especially for AI service that I'm leveraging OpenAI. You can leverage either through a SaaS-based service or like a cloud-based service, or you actually can use something that you build on, on your own. It's really up to you. So first and foremost, from an instrumentation, especially if you want to leverage distributed tracing, is first, you need to find a supported programming language. Right now, things like Golang, Node, Python, that's actually pretty OK. And what you do is you add an instrumentation library. An instrumentation library is just an SDK that wraps around your application and start automatically improve instrumentation and give you a context what's going on right there. Next, what we do is we're adding context to understand it, and we use tracing as a way of pinpointing delays within my service where it actually goes wrong like that. So as mentioned early, this is a very high level talk. If you're interested, you can go to the technical workshop. I'll cover a bit more on tracing, and we can talk more on the finer details around it. Lastly, just to wrap it up, uh, GPT-4 is actually in development right now. And that could be what I call the tipping point of AI, where it's starting getting very close to human comprehension. There's a lot of good things we can do right there. So as mentioned early, OpenAI is actually widely available or available as an API service, and it's actually pay as you go. I think it's fair because if you look at traditionally AI service is very expensive. What API, open API, uh, open AI does is actually make it very uh, accessible to a lot of engineers and it democratizes AI service right there. With that, thank you so much. I hopefully give you some idea what you can see with open AI, but also the possibility around it. But I also want to talk more on the secondary side, which is uptime reliability. And in this talk, I just kind of give you a very high level overview where you want to use tracing as a way of pinpointing, is it dope or is it you? With that, thank you so much. I'll hand over it uh, uh, for the MC and we continue on with Q&A. All right. Thank you very much, Steve. What an amazing talk. And I have a couple of questions that uh, from the audience as well, and I think one of the coolest ones is how could future improvements in these AI models improve tracing tools and observability? What do you think? Yeah, so that's a two separate question, right? Um, I think for AI to continue to evolve and get better, uh, whether we're lucky or not, we're all contributing to data. <laughs> that's the way of doing it, right? So that's the only way you improve the data. The good news is on the tracing side, uh, like people like myself, uh, I usually do quite a lot of in-depth talks and just recommending when you do tracing, what you should capture, what you shouldn't capture, because ultimately your time is in, like building good code, like building what I call features, not actually doing instrumentation and all the nitty gritty stuff. All right, thank you. And I can see in the chat as well, um, developer Steve mentioned that GPT-3 could actually create GPT-4. Um, and what do you, I want to know, what do you think about that? Is that something that maybe scares you, or do you th feel like that's an exciting thing for the future? Yeah, I think I think at least OpenAI GPT-3, they're being open about it. They're telling you that they're collecting their data to make it better. <laughs> at least they're, they're telling you up front. Uh, most services, whether we would like it or not, especially as an engineer, we all know what all the tech companies are doing, and sometimes we're happily trading data in order to get that service. Hmm. But at least I think GPT-3, they're being open about it, and they did tell people, hey, we're using your data to make GPT-4. So again, I think at least they're being honest about it. All right. On a more of a lighter note, uh, I want to ask, you mentioned GitHub Copilot. Um, yeah. Do you use it personally? And maybe what's the, what's the coolest or maybe the scariest experience that you've had using it, if you use it yourself? Yeah, I only have very, very basic level of using GitHub Copilot. Uh, for me, I think it's quite interesting where, let's say you write, let's say, a function or loop or a specific class, it actually kind of gives you recommendation like Google. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Hey, you're writing function or class. We suggest that you write this way. And it can be scary, but also can quite be fun at the same time. But also means if you're not careful, you're going to write really shitty code <laughs> if you're not careful yeah. with that. Yeah. That's true. That's true. And what about maybe uh, you've tried Dolly Mini? Uh, I don't know if you're invited to the Dolly. No, uh, I'm not that fortunate out. one. Maybe there's some other people that are more fortunate than me. Yeah. Like for me, uh, I have too many topics and too many services to use. Uh, I kind of use whatever is available. But I think that's fair because you know, if I want to evaluate a particular product, technology, or service, I want to evaluate when it's publicly available. All right. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, your talk has been amazing, and I, I love your question uh, answers as well. Uh, but. Now we will move on to our next next speaker. So thank you, Steve.